let me start by setting out my general premise, um, which is that I assume that the powers that government agents have in terms of collecting personal information are very large. Um, and I expect that government agents will generally use these powers in good faith. Um, they will try to serve what they see as the national interest and their, their statutory objectives. I, I at least assume that much. Um, but that these powers are very large and that the, the remedies available to individuals are uh, often quite limited. Uh, so we mentioned uh, um, Pipeda. That put me in mind of the decision of Mr. Justice Sharp of the Ontario Court of Appeal in Jones and Sega in 2012, where he recognized a new tort of invasion of privacy uh, on the basis that uh, the complainant in that case fell between the, uh, the various stools of the federal and provincial privacy legislation. So we have very broad powers uh, um, with limited recourse to uh, judicial remedies um, or uh, even potentially administrative uh, remedies. That's my starting point. And of course, we also have, as, as Michael uh, pointed out, situations in which uh, even, even though the powers are very broad, the state action uh, might fall outside even those uh, broad mm -hmm. mandates, as in the, uh, the Wi-Fi example. Uh, so that's my premise. And I'm going to make five points. Um, first, about... Um, the achievements of the common law in imposing constraints on governmental discretion. Uh, second, some of the, the difficulties the common law faces uh, when uh, there are broadly drawn discretionary powers. Um, third, I'm going to talk about ex post and ex ante controls on discretion, uh, ex post being judicial review and ex ante being things that happen inside a government department which uh, structure the use of discretionary powers before they are used. Um, fourth, then, I'm going to suggest that the common law's achievement in imposing limits on discretionary powers actually becomes something of a pathology in the area of uh, judicially enforceable rights. Um, and uh, finally, then, I'll suggest that um, in order to respond to this pathology, we need to break down the distinction which is sometimes drawn between administrative law and constitutional law, focus on uh, public law techniques, uh, focus on encouraging the use of soft law, uh, uh, guidelines, operational manuals, and so on, inside government in order to uh, improve um, the, uh, or in order to ensure that individuals can exercise their rights with uh, as little fear as possible of government interference. So first, um, the common, common lawyers are justifiably proud of their ability to impose constraints on discretion. Um, and so common law courts, uh, although there, are, there have been bumps in the road, and I think of uh, Liversidge and Anderson uh, and Lord Atkins, famous dissent in that case, a case about wartime detention, uh, which could be justified on the, uh, in the discretion of the minister. The House of Lords in Liversidge uh, gave a very broad scope to the minister. Um, but generally, uh, that has not been the approach that has been preferred. Rather, you see, as in the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Roncarelli and Duplessis, uh, most notably the judgment of Mr. Justice Rand, the idea that at common law, there is no untrammeled discretion. The common law will always impose fetters on discretion by ensuring, that, by insisting, that powers be exercised for a proper purpose, uh, taking into account relevant considerations uh, rationally and fairly. Uh, and this, I think, has been a significant achievement of the common law and one that common lawyers are justifiably proud of. But on to my second point, the, there is a problem uh, in the common law tradition. Because while on the one hand we uh, respect this uh, idea of making sure that there's no untrammeled or unfettered discretion, 
that is an aspect of the, the rule of law, the common lawyers also respect the sovereignty of parliament. And so where parliament decides to confer a broadly drawn power on an administrative decision maker or government agent of some description, well, the courts have to give some content to that. They have to respect the, the breadth of the discretion that Parliament wanted to impose. And so you see, even in that, that famous passage from Mr. Justice Rand's opinion in Roncarelli, he makes uh, reference to uh, express language. In situations where Parliament has been clear about its intentions, well, in those circumstances, uh, courts uh, have to give effect to it, uh, even if it means that the power uh, would indeed be very uh, broad. And so uh, here we have the, the beginnings of a difficulty. Um, and where it becomes more difficult uh, is in the era of judicially enforceable rights, uh, typically found in instruments like the Canadian Charter or the European Convention on Human Rights. And um, here I uh, turn to talk about ex post and ex ante controls. Um, and so you'll see that the, uh, the common lawyer's traditional approach is to say, uh, well, uh, the safeguard that the common law provides against the abuse of discretionary powers is judicial review. After the fact, ex post. Uh, and we will look at what the agent did and uh, we will determine whether he acted inside or outside his powers. Of course, that assumes that you know that the, um, the official uh, used his powers uh, at all, which uh, in the area of privacy and surveillance is not uh, a given. What judicially enforceable rights instruments do uh, is uh, impose some ex ante controls. Um, and so you see reference in, the, in Section 1 of the Canadian Charter and in various parts of the European Convention, a reference to the idea, or the requirement, I, I should say, that limitations on rights have to be prescribed by law. What does that mean? Uh, well, the, um, the, certainly the European Court of Human Rights has been very clear that this means that where rights are infringed, it must be done in a way that is foreseeable, uh, predictable, and accessible. Uh, there must be some ex ante control. When the individual is sitting down deciding uh, whether to uh, write a blog post, attend a protest march, or even make a telephone call in some instances, he should be able or she should be able to determine with some level of precision whether the government is going to use its discretionary powers uh, to interfere with that activity. Um, and generally, the trend in, in Canada uh, and uh, in Europe has been to interpret protected rights, expression rights, association rights, privacy rights, quite broadly, um, uh, in order to uh, expand the sphere of protected activity. Um, and the prescribed by law requirement uh, comes in at that point and should impose uh, requirements that uh, action be uh, foreseeable, uh, predictable, uh, and uh, accessible. And here is where, fourth point, the common law's um, success becomes something of a pathology. Um, as a common lawyer will say, all we're interested in are ex post controls as long as we're there afterwards to make sure that the power was used within the four corners of the statute. It wasn't used for an improper purpose. It wasn't used irrationally. It wasn't used unfairly. Well, that's enough. In those circumstances, the, the action was, was prescribed by law, by virtue of the fact that it was a lawful exercise of discretion. And there's a fascinating uh, passage in the judgment of Lord Justice Laws, at first instance in the David Miranda case, the case of Glenn Greenwald's partner who was transiting through Heathrow and he was uh, detained and searched by the authorities. And Lord Justice Laws, brilliant uh, common law mind, uh, attacked the European Court of Human Rights for uh, 
for its insistence that um, uh, some powers can be so broad that you need to impose additional ex-ante controls on them. Lord Justice Law said, Strasbourg Court has misunderstood the common law. The common law does not recognize unfettered discretion. Uh, stop interfering, uh, people in Strasbourg, with our, the way we do things here. Of course, I, I think, Lord Justice Laws is, is misconceived. A power can be fettered in the sense that ex post controls exist and courts can ensure that the decision maker was within the four corners of the statute, but that's not necessarily enough. Uh, in a world where you have a prescribed by law requirement which aims to make sure that government action which might infringe rights is foreseeable, predictable and accessible, the ex post controls are not enough. And what the European Court of Human Rights is saying is, okay, the discretion might be fettered, but it's still really broad. And that's problematic. And you need to have guidelines in place about how you're to use the powers. And this you see in the, the appeal judgment in Miranda. Uh, Lord Dyson, master of the rolls, takes a different approach from Lord Justice Laws and says, you know, the powers here are very broad and they're not limited by uh, in any serious way. They're not limited in an ex ante sense. There's no guidance available to the, the officers who are exercising the, the search and detention powers in Heathrow Airport. Uh, there's no guidance available to David Miranda as he transits through, which would give him some idea of what he might, uh, of what he might face. Um, and this, I, I think, is a, uh, a blind spot of the, the common law. If you have someone like as eminent as Lord Justice Laws, uh, rejecting the idea that um, very broad powers are problematic, uh, you've got a, a very Im important and very uh, and potentially damaging difference of perspective. And I think the Strasbourg Court is right to insist that the in what some might call the internal point of view, the internal point of view both of the officials who are going to exercise the powers and of an individual who is going to be subject to them, that's an important perspective. And there should be uh, guidelines uh, as to how the powers uh, ought to be exercised, guidelines that would confine, structure, and check the discretion. And this leads me to suggest that uh, we might want to make a sharper distinction, or we might want to reject a sharp distinction between uh, administrative law, which looks to confine uh, discretion within the four corners of the statute, and constitutional law, which looks to uh, protect uh, rights and protect them in a, in a very broad way. And what I think we, we could usefully do, uh, I'm on to my, my fifth point now, uh, is to encourage, uh, through public law, maybe through administrative law, maybe through constitutional law, but what we should encourage is the adoption of soft law uh, in the form of guidelines, operations, manuals, whatever, uh, to better structure, confine, uh, and check the discretion, uh, the very broad discretion of government agents uh, in the area of privacy and surveillance. If a, uh, a government agency does not put in place sufficient checks and balances internally, now, then we should not consider its action to have been prescribed by law because it is neglecting this important uh, function, uh, this uh, feature, this requirement that one finds in the Canadian Charter uh, and again in the European Convention. Um, and certainly I think a, a flexible approach is, uh, is preferable. And for common lawyers who like to say, well, we have... We do not recognize unfettered discretion, and this is one of the great triumphs of the common law. Well, that may be so, uh, but there uh, may yet be things that we can learn uh, from uh, other traditions. Uh, there may be something we can learn from the prescribed by law function, and there may be something to the idea of ex ante controls uh, rather than uh, ex post controls, and the courts, uh, uh, in, in the, even in the common law world, should not hesitate to impose those requirements on government officials. Thank you.